Welcome everyone to the Anthology Summit 2024. Today is the 6th of March, 2024. And this is the um, Ontology Summit on Neurosymbolic Techniques for and with Ontologies and Knowledge Graphs. Basically, what we found from the fall series is that neural network and traditional AI techniques are complementary. And uh, so we wanted to, to have a main series where we explore this topic in more generality than just LLMs. So today we're going to have the first session of track B, which is going to be looking again at large language models, ontologies and knowledge graphs. And the moderator for today is Gary <laughs> Burkross. And I will hand it over now to you, Gary. Okay, uh, so I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so last week uh, we kicked off the uh, session uh, track A and our, our uh, summit with a discussion of some of the limitations of large language models that, to provide a robust AI such as seen in this triangular diagram, which not only includes, includes machine learning and learning on top, but also complex reasoning and, and ontologies and uh, things like uh, common knowledge. So last week, track uh, one, track A, focused on architecture and foundations, while track two, this one, is a more general relationship between large language models and ontologies. But I thought it would be useful to review some of the foundational topics from the first session, and in particular, go into some issues about the effect of scale uh, and the debate over the possibilities of emergent properties. So with that, let me, uh, let me uh, show you this slide which is an attempt to summarize some of the important points made by our speakers from last week, Gary Marcus and John Sower. On the left, we have seven of Gary's foundational ideas for a robust, trustworthy AGI. So it should include uh, rich cognitive models like descriptions of mental processes to keep track of dynamic environments. These, by the way, uh, tend to align with uh, things that John Sower says in another way, which is on the right side. Uh, so Gary argues that we, for AGI, we need extensive real-world knowledge beyond what is covered in text, and it should represent complex relationships, such as causal relationships, which are important to manipulate the world and achieve specific goals as an agent. It should be composable, so we want to assemble holes from parts in the reverse. Uh, we want common uh, sense knowledge. I think that's important, uh, as past uh, summits have, have discussed. And these, maybe these would be learned through embodied experiences, which mining text does not provide. So that's a limitation. AGI should include sophisticated reasoning, such as for symbols, logic, rules, and it should have some representation of understanding of human values. Now on the right side, we have Johns, which align pr pretty well, have different words and maybe different, different emphasis. This is just a small part of a, his large presentations. Um, he points out there's no fixed set of meanings that adequately describe co a continuous, dynamically changing world. Uh, I, I pause here because, of course, that is perhaps also a challenge for ontological representation, so maybe more to be said about that. He points out that written language is isolated from a range of cognitive functions like perception, feeling, and, uh, uh, and emotions. Uh, obviously, I guess that's point number seven of John, is, which is, you know, human values. Um, John uh, also emphasized the importance of mental models for intelligence, and th this is probably lost when we map text to LLMs without such a model intervening to, to interpret what the words mean or the sentences mean. And finally, a linear language of notation such as in text is not ideal for thinking or communicating, so a representational issue. This next slide, I wanted to sort of Provide, provide a little bit more on the other side of the argument uh, because both Gary and John sort of were very much about the limitations of LLM. Well, what, are, what are some of the people who back it say? Well, here are just three related points that are often sort of listed. The first is that maybe there is some possibility that just statistical learning, low level, might allow some learning 
to understand the world in a way that mimics human general intelligence. So we don't quite know all the possibilities there, perhaps, what the foundations might be. The second argument, which we'll go into a little bit more, is that we might have something like an evolution of emergent properties that comes out, even though we aren't stuck with that. It could work a little bit like evolution seems to work from the bottom up uh, and getting more adaptive as it goes on. And third is the scalability argument, which is that training LLMs with more data, more computing power and so forth, just might lead to more real intelligence or an explosion over time. So that you get a qualitative difference rather than just a quantitative difference. Well, okay, let's take a look at that uh, scale issue again. Uh, you'll, you will notice the graphic here, which is from Gary's presentation, which is a big, a big line drawn out to the idea that scale is all you need. And he provided a variety of uh, arguments be, uh, about that, including stories about how uh, scaling still leads to many, many problems and the idea also that maybe when we're thinking about sort of a, something emerging, it's a generalization within the domain or very simple analogy from the domain elsewhere and not really learning something outside of the domain of training. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the right side, I have some text. So it says, you know, essentially maybe LLMs, because they have a, a deep neural network with hundreds and now thousands of layers can act over time like they have a higher level, like a cortex, which generates what we think of as having concepts about uh, about the other things that, that it learned in the other layers. I mean, for example, we don't if we have a thousand layer one, we don't really know what's what's learned between layers nine hundred and one thousand one to, to say a, num a number. Okay, so uh, so that's some of the arguments about about scaling. Here's some of the arguments about emergent properties. In this case, these are some of the, uh, the, the claims that are made, the three on the right side. Uh, one is essentially that uh, we get rapid performance improvement as the LLMs grow in size. And, and suddenly it seems to some people they exhibit improvements on tasks such as, and this has been, you know, these are things that people test, simple reasoning, answering open questions comprehensively and even co-generation. They also make the argument that maybe it's something like a phase transition with size. So it's qualitative difference over time, not just quantitative. And third, uh, based on a few shot learning. So you train something up in uh, a general sense, but then you give it just a few examples in a new domain and it learns that very rapidly. So this, the idea is that you don't have to go through a huge amount of training if you got the right type of foundation. All of this, by the way, is, is uh, the references on here from uh, Jason Wee. Uh, uh, now, here's something on the other side uh, about the immersion. Essentially, it, um, the argument is that it depends on the choice of metrics we use to see if something is emerging. Specifically, nonlinear or discontinuous metrics produce apparent immersion abilities, whereas linear or continuous metrics produce smooth, continuous, predictable changes in model development. Uh, so the idea is that you know, we need to study this more carefully and see how we're actually trying to measure these abilities. And to finish up on my slides, where are we? Well, so I might leverage an earlier article uh, by Baman Sani uh, et al. on opportunities and risk of foundational articles. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a cautionary uh, note here. It's perhaps still advice. It's a caution, it cautions us about emerging capabilities because of defects of foundational models that are inherited by all the other adaptive models downstream of them. So despite the impending or uh, the, the widespread deployment of foundational models, we currently lack a clear understanding of how they work, when they fail, and what they are even capable of. And so we end with this idea that we really need some critical research on foundational models, which because they are so influential, uh, and this will require deep interdisciplinary collaboration commensurate with the their found, found fundamentally social technolo technological nature of these models. So with that as context, let me try to let me introduce today's speaker. We are very happy to have as our first speaker for track two or B on LMs and ontology, Hamid. Um, Babale Giglu, who is a researcher at TIB and is currently involved in the neurosymbolic scholarly improvement extraction, which is abbreviated as SciNext project. 
in collaboration with Open Research Knowledge Graph, ORKG project at TIB, the German National Library of Science and Technology. Hamid has a bachelor's and master's degree in computer sciences and worked as a natural language processing um, uh, worked at, worked at the industry in natural language research for more than three years in industry before, named, before joining TIB as a PhD candidate. Currently, he's pursuing that degree in computer science, NLP, and semantic web technologies under the supervision of Dr. Jennifer D'Souza and Professor Soren Oral. His current research focuses on employing LLMs in various ontological tasks, such as ontology learning and ontology matching, and that is the uh, title of his talk, Exploring LLMs for Ontology, Ontology Learning and Ontology Mapping. And with that, let me stop sharing and turn it over to Hamid. Yeah, thanks, Gary, for the introduction. And let me to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. We can see. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation again. And um, I'm happy to be here to present our work around ontology learning using LLMs. And uh, here, uh, if I could. Uh, technically, ontology learning involves automatically identifying terms, types, relation, and potentially axioms from textual information, from textual data. And the ultimate goal here is the knowledge acquisition and representation. And a quick review in the traditional approaches show that most of the approaches are based on clustering statistical approaches or lexical syntactical pattern mining, and which they applied these techniques to construct ontologies from the unstructured or semi-structured textual data with the following aims. The most of the approaches try to learn new concepts or relationships or enrich the existing ontologies with new concepts or adding more relationships. Or even some of those works try to build the taxonomies from scratch or extend the existing ontologies. Uh, related work of this work is available in the Open Research Knowledge Graph as comparison, which you can refer to this for more detailed bit of the analysis. However, with recent advancement in NLP throughout LLMs offer a paradigm shift in ontology learning tasks. And within this work, we aim to study whether this paradigm sh shift is approved or suitable or not. So we, within this LMs for all, we hypothesize that can LM effectively apply their learning language, their language pattern capturing capability for ontology learning or not. Since the LMs are being developed in a rapid speed and they show the human-like responses in the field of the emergent AI, our experimental consideration in this work is with, with respect to two questions. Do the characteristics of LM justify ontology learning? And second, which LM to test? Uh, before diving into the LMs for all task paradigm, it's important to how to formulate the, the task for using the LMs. So considering the primitive ontology that has been introduced by Alexander and Stefan from the University of Stuttgart, University of Stuttgart. It consists of the five steps. First, a set of strings that describe the lexical term and they, re, they have been extracted from textual data. Next, there, those conceptual type based on the terms will be extracted. And later, a step in the step three, there will be a taxonomy construction based on those types. And the next step involved is a set of non toxin relationships that describe domain range and restriction arranged in the hierarchy of relationship. And the lastly, axiom A will be extracted. And because it is important to not just feed the prompt to the LMs to 
extract the ontologies because most of the time they hallucinate and we don't have any control over this hallucination and most of the time it goes beyond what we expected and due to this reason we just carefully crafted down to a lens for oil with respect to the these three steps step two three and four and here we can see the lens for oil task paradigm that considers the conceptualization module of ontology learning with three tasks, term typing, type taxonomy discovery, and type non taxonomy relation extraction, which in all of these tasks, we aim to study how effective are LMs for automated ontology learning. And the LMs, the the LMs that are being studied in this work are from three categories, encoder, decoder, and encoder, decoder. With an encoder, we just fit text and we expect the LM to generate uh, representations, or sometimes we call these models as a mask language model, BERT variants, which we just fill the some places and expect the LMs to predict that place, the mask, mask token. And in a decoder module, they just see previous tokens to generate new tokens. And in the encoder decoder, we have a combination of both uh, modules. And within this, we chose 11 LLMs from this three category with different number of the parameters. Also to study how the increasing the number of the parameters are affecting the ontology learning. Also, we consider the one domain specific LLM that to see whatever the domain specific fine tuned LLMs are capable of the programming better than the general specific LLMs. So, uh, and also the, how to query the LLMs. Prompt engineering is the approach that we can use to query the LM, but we aim to use the standard prompting as a, it is represent a fundamental approach for instructing LM. So with, within this prompting technique, we will consider the LMs as a knowledge base and check whatever they have a capability for being used for ontology learning or not. So we don't want to use complex prompting because the, our focus was initial exploration of task and identify the area that we need uh, further improvement and understand how much we accomplished so far before diving into the more complex techniques. So once we have a clear picture of the how models, how LLMs are working and what is the limitation, we can consider a, prompt engineering techniques by formulating ontology learning as a stepwise reasoning task. So empirical validation scenario as shown as for, we have a corpus uh, for different, from different domains. So, and terminologies which is extracted from those corpuses. Then we will use those as a gold standard to evaluate task A, task B, and task C. In this work, we, did, we didn't consider axiom discovery because it's as the complexity of the work. And from the data set viewpoint, for the task A, we considered five sources from three different domains, such as semantic geography and biomedicine. And here you can see the statistics of the data set that have been used in the task A. We use most of the samples for the, we use a large portion of the data for the testing rather than the training the model. Here you can see the complete train set, but in the fine tuning part, we just use a small fraction, eight sample per time. And to query LM, we, construct this to prompt, close prompt and prefix prompt. Close prompt are being used to query the encoder based models where they see the mass token to generate the possible candidates. And prefix, prefix prompts are being used for the written instruction also attached to the close prompt being used to query 
decode their base models, which they are seeing, they see the previous token to generate new token. And here we can see the uh, examples of the prompt that we considered. For example, here, the company manufacture plastic chairs, manufacture part of his POS is mask, and we expect all limbs to generate work. This is a from the work net data set that we used. And here, the second the prompt performance synthesis compilation on the following text. And we expect that model to identify rock metal as a mountain in the Andorra. And the last prompt is sample, example prompt is for the medicine. The reason why we didn't provide the information for the task for the LMs was that, as I previously mentioned, we didn't want to instruct the LM specifically to work on the task. For example, we didn't mention that the data set here is about the geographical locations and we want to identify the place because we want to see the how much they know without providing the information. So to conclude for each data set we construct a, a template and so for each data set we have a template to query the LLMs. And for task B, which is the taxonomy discovery, we consider three sources from three different domains, geography, by medicine, and content type from schema.org. We construct the data set using these three steps, where we, if A is a, is a super, class, super class of the B, we cannot argue that B is superclass of the A. So we consider this state A superclass of the B as a true statement and the reverse of this statement is a negative. So also we consider the transition relationship between the types. If A is a superclass of B and B is a superclass of C, we can argue that A is a superclass of C, but reverse of this is false. So we consider the second first statement as a positive and the second statement as a negative. And here we can see the statistic of the Data set. As you can see, we just consider a small sample, small portion of the data which we constructed for the train and most of the data to test. And there also the another reason that we use small samples for the train is that maybe in the real world scenario, when we have a challenging domain or topic, we want to and the LMs are failed to cope with this in the new domains maybe we can construct a small sample and fine tune the LMs and expect them to work well with for the tasks. And, and here we can see the prompt engineering that we followed, similar to the task A. And here we can see the examples. For example, reservation is a superclass of the bus reservation. This statement is mask and we expect the LMs to identify it. This is a true. And similarly for the other domains or, or other domains in this task also we construct a similar uh, prompt. Overall eight prompts are being designed for this task as well. And the lastly, for the last task, not taxonomic relationship extraction, we considered one source from one domain by medicine. Similar to the task B, we construct the samples and we use most of the data for the testing rather than training. And also we follow the same, same technique that we used in the previous task to construct the prompt. And for example, virus is a, interacts with human and interact with is a relationship between virus and human and we expect this statement is true or false, and we expect LM to say that this is true. And similarly for other for decoder-based models, also we follow the same intuition that we had. And within this, we can see the summary of results. Of course, there was a lots of the results that are being considered ex experimented with different LMs. So we just report the maximum accuracy or maximum mean average precision per task. So here we can see that for WordNet with simple types, just four type, we can see that larger models working well, especially GPT 3.5 with 91.7%. And however, when we increase the number of the types, as 
we saw in the GNN with a large number of the different types, 680 types. You can see that even larger models fail to obtain a big, good results. And you can see there's a 4% just difference between the small bird to large model. Yeah. So, and also for the medical domain, NCI, SNOMED, and medicine, we can see that the larger model is failing to provide a good uh, result for task eight, where we aim to identify terms types. So, smaller model even working very well than the larger models. For task B, we can see that larger models for different domains are working with uh, good. They are obtaining very comparative results. However, for the ch more challenging task, uh, task C, none of the language models uh, are stood out and still they are suffering from the identifying non toxin relationships. And also the domain specific fine tuning, as we mentioned, that we aim to study the domain specific fine tuning or trained models. So PubMed BERT as a domain specific model is not working very well in the domain and medicine, medical domains, and general LLMs are working very better than this. And within this, we, with an increase in, overall, with an increase in the number of departments, we can expect an improvement in the other learning tests. So LLMs are showing a good capability toward ontology learning and zero shot testing results indicated that while LAMP seems to be promising for ontology learning, they would need task specific fine tuning to be practically viable solution. To uh, study this, we adopted the instruction tuning as described in the Google Plan T5 paper. So we just instantiated instruction from a small selection of the samples. And for per eight samples per type from task A, B considered with long the small fraction of the trained data set that we had. So we constructed this from templates using those examples. And then we combine them and we find tuning the Flan T5. And here we can see the results of the Flan T5. In the overall, with respect to the main model, Flan T5 variant showing the 25% improvement. However, with respect to the obtained zero shot testing models that we had for the WordNet. It's failed to obtain a very good performance with the, and also for the GNM, also it's performed very worse. So with increasing number of the types, we we might lose some kind of the information as the zero LMs have. Also for the biomedicine, they showed a great capability, but still there is a room for improvement. For the task B, you can see there is improvement between the UMLs and the schema. And how also for the UMLs for the task C, we can see the small improvement of the 4%. So to obtain a paper, and also this shows that to obtain a better performance, we don't need to have a larger LLM. Small LLMs might work if we fine tune appropriately. And here we can see the visualization of the different LLMs for different tasks. As we can see, the fine tuning improved improved the previous models in general, but they all they might need also further fine tuning because the general fine tuning general LMs are working very comparatively and very well. And here we can see that Lama. Lama. The time of the working on this project, there was Lama 1 out and we experimented with zero shot testing. And we can see that there is a, a low performance with respect to the other LMs. And this shows that uh, maybe a few shots prompting will help, will help in the, obtaining the better performance in the model similar to the Lama. And also we can see that NCI solvent ontologies are performing very poorly in the task A. And this might be a reason that 
we might need a heuristic-based answer set mapping to generate the text to map the uh, correct labels. And within this, the overall conclusion is that LMs, we just test LMs for the ontology of learning using the extensive you know, LMs. And but the obtained empirical results show that fundamental LMs are not sufficiently suitable for ontology construction. That entails a high degree of reason and scale and domain expert. But when they are fine-tuning, they just might work as a suitable assistant. And also we just share the, our codes for the community, but still we need to explore more recent LMs and incorporating more ontologies and even building more benchmark data sets that consider more, more domains and also optimizing the three LMs for our task. And I'm happy to share this news that since the LMs for L require a lot of the work, but the limited number of interest the people in this field are exploring the fitness of LMs for L. And in response to this, we are organizing the LMs for L challenge in the International Semantic Web Conference with aim of the attracting novel approaches and works for ontology learning. We will consider the term typing, taxon discovery, and non-taxon relationship extraction within two phase. Few shot with the train and test set will share some information. However, the zero shot testing phase, there will be no training set to simulate the real world scenario. And also we can, we plan to consider the more ontology such as the gene ontology, the video food ontology, basic form ontologies, or ontologies from humanities and social science. The list may be changing the, the time of the program, uh, holding the competition and challenge. And within this, my presentation comes to the end. And thanks for your so, so thank you very much, Hamid. We'll make sure that we advertise your challenge for 2024. And uh, just a, a note from me before we turn it over to the audience for more questions and comments. I just really like the fact that this is what you showed is what a, a real pro project trying to understand some of these things, what goes into it is like. Uh, and uh, start, and therefore, I think the challenge will be a good thing going forward. So with that, uh, let's see what people have to say. Uh, there's a chat, so some people will, will do that. Some people will, uh, uh, so if you stop sharing, we'll probably be able to see people raise their yeah. hand. Uh, and uh, of course, we're pretty liberal of people can, if we don't walk, if we don't talk over each other, people can just speak up. But uh, so far, I'm not sure I see a hand. Uh, here, well, not surprising. Robbie has a hand. Oh, <laughs> go ahead and mm -hmm. unmute, Robbie. I have two questions. One was on the H T, and I could not catch the meaning of H underscore T. So, what was that? Can you kindly explain? Because it was more like a definition. And number yeah, two. it was definition from Alexander and Stephen work in the ontology learning for semantic web. It's still describing the hierarchical relationships. Taxonomy is a relationship between the types. So, for example, I A see. is a superclass of the B and so on. So, it's hierarchical and yeah. for the test ontology, is it? For T test. is a type. 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 I get it now. I, I also thought some similar meaning. The second mm -hmm. question I have on the chat is NCI related results always seemed lower. So is that because it is very highly correlated medical information and is different than usual LLM targets or sources? Uh the error analysis, during the error analysis, we understood that LMs are generating lots of information. And mostly during the generation, there is a, a lots of information beside the type that they have generated. 
and we used some, some kind of the answer set mapping that to map those generated texts to the uh, to the grand truth. Maybe we just saw that maybe we need more uh, realistic answer set mapping to identify or hierarchical based uh, mapping to identify those. But yeah, that was the reason. And also another reason was that for somehow those types are not existed in those LMs because nowadays most of the LMs are using the data sets that are available in the field. And maybe that was the reason behind it, but still is we think that this is due to the answer set mapping. Thank you. Thank you. Todd, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I have two questions, but I you already answered one of them. My first question was, how were you going to, or if you were going to incorporate foundational ontologies into your work? And your last slide indicated that you're going to try and work with BFO. So mm -hmm. we'll skip that question. The next question is, have you run a logical reasoner on the output of this work to look for logical consistencies? No, to be honest, no. We didn't run it, okay. but it would Thank be you. great to do this. Thank you. So Hamid, I had Thank a you. question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Are you still answering? No, no. I, I had a question on your task C which is uh, in the sphere of uh, what Gary Marcus was talking about, complex non-taxonomic relationships. It seemed that GPT-3 uh, was doing better than GPT-4 on geonames, at least. And so that that goes against this, this the naive scaling idea, or it, it may be that the variability is such that if there is such a concept, that there's not a significant difference between these two. I wonder if you have anything... Thoughts on that? I think the one thing that we didn't test, and for that, because of this, I cannot answer this question, you know, uh, more bit confident is that we didn't try the few shot prompting. Maybe if we just try with few shot prompting, larger LMs will work very greatly. But yeah, with zero shot prompting, we, we can see that the larger LMs gets, they require more. Uh, instructions to work or behave appropriately. So because of this, I think it's... Yeah, I have another question while people are cogitating out there, although Todd might have another one. So I'm interested in the, uh, the possibility of testing learning to learn, which is the idea that you, you provide a base and then because of that, you don't need as much training. You have a, a few shots, as you say. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you test two shots versus five shots versus nine shots, I mean, can you see a learning to learn phenomenon here on, on that? Is anybody, do you know if anybody's looked at something like that? Uh, no, actually there, and also if we try to do that, the, there's a loss of the LM that makes it more challenging to test it because we saw that different LMs are behaving differently. And even with this challenge, we aim to attract the people that are trying to do these things using the different LMs for different scenarios. And within the te zero shot testing, we will just provide some kind of the terms and we expect the participant to, you know, do anything which they want. They can use the different ontologies types to add the nine shot, three shot or different shot to see whatever they are working. But uh, technical in the one of the projects in the ontology matching, we tried this few shot prompting. And weirdly, uh, with three shot and six shot, for that test, we saw that there is a, you know, lower performance with respect to this zero shot prompting. And I'm not sure if we are going to observe this per, such a be behavior in the ontology learning or not, but I believe that it's worth experimenting it. I see that Todd has his hand up again, so. Yes. Um, thank you, Gary. A follow-on question, and I realize you can't give a, a direct or complete answer to this question, but back to the issue of using a reasoner to check for logical consistency. 
Could you speculate on how you could incorporate the use of the results of a reasoner, in particular if it discovers inconsistencies, into the entire learning process? Uh, maybe I, I will have to Again, I, I, yeah. It's just a uh, speculation. That's all I'm looking for, if you have any thoughts. Uh, at the moment, no. But the point is that we, we don't do the... In the most of the experiment, we didn't conduct the train fine tunings. So learning this technique that you are mentioning, I'm not familiar with this technique, but it might work in the process and the output of the LMS to see whatever they are mapping to the grand truth or not. But it's uh, we just said that uh, maybe we can use uh, some kind of heuristic based method. But the approach that you are mentioning is, I think, is capable of that as well. But as I said, I'm not, I didn't work on this. Okay. Well, understood. But bear in mind that one of the values of having a, a well created or well, you know, well curated ontology is that it's logically consistent in that you can have confidence any results you get out from inferencing. Sorry, can you ask? Um, well, if you run, if you have a well constructed ontology, and mm -hmm. you're using it for your information system, then when inferences are created by your reasoner, you have a high confidence that those inferences are correct, as opposed to hallucinations that a large language model may create using its mechanism for reasoning, whatever that might be. So hence, you know, if, if you're going to create an ontology automatically, users of that ontology would have an expectation that it is logically consistent. I hope I'm making myself clear. I'm sorry if I'm not. Sorry, I'm not. Feel anyone point. else on the call feel to speak up and, and amplify this point or clarify if I've not been clear, which may be the case. From what no, I'm able anyway. to understand, Todd is saying that inference and reasoning are highly correlated. Is that right, Todd? Um. Well, it depends on the type of reasoning, if you like. And I'm speaking strictly of logical reasoning. And in the case, if you're working in OWL, DL reasoners. So I don't have any answer for this question. Maybe you would look into I, 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 didn't, maybe. I didn't expect one. That's okay. So I, I was just wondering. Um, Thank you. Be, before we turn to Ravi, Ravi, if I might just... I, you know, we have a, a a track on the medical domain. I see that we have Alan Rector here. I just was wondering, and try and uh, apologize for putting you on the spot. I'm just wondering if you have any recommended research that we should be sure to include in our track on the, the medical realm and the uh, LLMs. So if you if you have any thoughts of that, we you could either put it into chat or you can tell us. Very good. Alan, you have to unmute. Well, he may be distracted on something else and he's just listening in occasionally. So I'll leave it there. Uh, there oh, here we, we are. are. He's unmuted. Sorry, I, I'm pressing the wrong button in the wrong place. That's There is <laughs> one that doesn't look. Um, actually, a lot of the reason I'm sitting in on these is to try and think through that that question. But I don't, I don't have any full answers at this point, except in relation to the last statement, I would expect LLMs to find there's when if you build an ontology in OWL, you're talking about universal statements that are absolutely guaranteed to be true. It there's a there's an implicit for all in front of everything in OWL. Um, and Many of the things that LLMs are going to find, many of the non-taxonomic relations, it's going to have found some examples of, and whether they always occur or not is questionable. So I suspect you will, 
I think running reasoners over it would be very interesting and would throw up would be likely to throw up some errors. But I'm not I wouldn't want to take generating something that could be reasoned over the an interesting question is which of the que there are statements like uh, breathlessness is a symptom of heart failure, which is not literally true all the time. Breathlessness is one of many symptoms of heart failure. It's also a symptom of a great many other things. It certainly isn't always caused by heart failure. So there are those kinds of distinctions which would need to be looked into to understand the relationship between what you could get out of a, what I would expect to come out of a, of an ontology of a LLM based system, which would be much more of an associational structure with some typology and some suggested relation and how you would actually verify that these were sufficiently strong to turn into axioms is a serious question. Many of the statements that are very important in knowledge are, when we say non-taxonomic, they're also, they're not universal. They are things that are generalizations that are useful and we want to have in our knowledge, but they're not, they're not, they're not things that you can put in and they're very difficult to represent an owl. And if you represent them in OWL, you usually have to represent them backwards. Um, that uh, heart failure, it, heart failure doesn't even always cause breathlessness. So neither neither way is universal. Some cases you have you have a case where one way around the expression can be made universal, another way it isn't. So that distinction is one which would be important if you were trying to think about the relationship between what you got out of learning from LLMs and what you wanted to represent in a description logic. That's what I can say at this point off the top of my head and without further thought about it. Well, thank you. I think John uh, Sowa has a uh, perhaps something to add. Uh, yes, the point that I wanted to make is that there are multiple uses for an ontology. And uh, uh, there can be uh, uh, one use is for parsing language to just to translate it into uh, some oh, uh, no. formal notation. And another one is for checking uh, some kind of reasoning to make sure that it's correct. Now, the, one, the kind that you would use for uh, guaranteeing correctness, or at least uh, an important check of correctness would be one that would be specific to a particular well, application or a domain of application in which the uh, definitions are absolutely uh, standard and they uh, uh, must be observed. Uh, the kind that you would use in a, a more looser kind of ontology, such as uh, uh, WordNet or things like that, uh, what, what are ones that where you use it for a likely interpretation for example, when parsing. So you have to have two kinds of ontologies, the ones that are guaranteed to be correct and the ones that are uh, approximately correct that are used for language analysis. Thank you, John. Uh, Ravi still has his hand up, so uh, why don't we turn to him for a minute? You're muted, uh, Ravi. I am asking one specific question to Hamid, little bit related to what John just said. Uh, first, how do you select the training set? Do you select it based on some criteria? If you do, does that criteria include dynamic changes to the training set? Uh... No, this is not included in dynamic changes. Technically, we use the existing ontologies because it's hard to, you know, make sure that what the LMs are generated are correct or not. So at the moment, we are in the testing stage. We want to see what are the, for example, we have ontologies. So we want to see whatever they are capable of the, uh, constructing them or not in the more simple way. 
So is that how you select the training part? Yeah, we do, yeah, we use all the existing ARM classes. Yeah. By creating a demo or simulation of some sort. Yeah. And then using it for the rest of the test set. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh. There are a couple of questions on the chat. Yeah. Bill Jackson has some questions. Bill has yeah. one. Can Bill. the system learn ontologies of verbs? Bill and Bobbin. Sorry. Just reading the name. Phil is asking you. Uh, right. I, I asked, can the system learn ontologies of verbs or actions or adjectives and, and properties as well as ontologies of nouns and, and classes? Uh, to answer your question, we didn't test this. We just want to see that what is the terms that are available in our verb or nouns or so on. So we didn't include a property, different properties or class. We just want to see the lexical term. What is the type of the lexical term part of speech actually? So okay. we didn't dive into you, this. You did have the word interacts, like... Uh... Viruses interact with humans, right? So a verb there. So you had some mm -hmm. verbs in your complex relationships. Yeah. But yeah, but we didn't uh, yeah. go further to those relationships, just taking the type. So because it's increased the complexity of work. Yeah. You also had the word function in, in one of them, I guess. And uh, you, to me, the, when I was looking at that, I was thinking, well, the system would have to go out and, and look up uh, a lot about what functions are, different types of functions, to think about process, what type of function is more relevant in the context of those nouns that are that are in the sentence. Mm -hmm. Mike, you have a comment or a question? No, oh, okay. Does Bobbin have a question? Was there another thing in text in the uh, yeah, in the there's chat? another Bob and Tigger. Bob and Tigger. Yeah, okay, Bob and doesn't reasoning imply a logical structure? And is the logical structure uh, one assumes in, an, in a neural net process? No, we didn't do any changes for the neural net, we just queried the LLMs to see how they are working. But, yeah. I uh, do you use neural nets? That's no. what Robin is asking. No, no, that's what just... I thought. You want to say something about next week? Well, yes. Uh, I, I can say something about next week. So next week, uh, we have a Fabian Newhouse, who is uh, actually published on this and uh, is going to essentially be talking about his initial publication. It's uh, the title of, uh, of the publication, Ontologies in the Era of Large Language Models, Dash, A Perspective. So I very much believe that Fabian has the type of background that will provide uh, a good overview of, of this vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, what is the what is the role, future, and interest in ontologies in the era of large language models, if that's what we call it. And Fabian has contributed to our various summits very actively uh, in uh, chairing right. some sessions and so on. And I, I should just add what I sort of the question I had for Alan because we have uh, areas, we have tracks on different areas such as biomedical, and we have uh, one on business and so forth. If people in the here have ideas about speakers that are good candidates for that, I think some of the track champions are still looking for the right type of speaker. So the fact that you heard this one may have some ideas about what you'd like to hear in some of those other tracks. And we'd welcome that type of, uh, I'm sure the other track champions like Robbie would welcome that type of input. Thank you very, yes, we are always looking and we have 
some synthesis sessions and some open sessions where we can accommodate new speakers. So kindly, Alan, please send it, send an email or some suggestions to us. Thank you. And others as well. So Todd, I'll put in chat again uh, another comment. Logical reasoning is applied to a collection of logical and non-logical symbols along with rules of inference on those symbols. And Mike, Mike tells Ah, Janet. Me. Janet has her hand up. Ah, good. Squeeze Janet in. Uh, yes, I was oh. wondering if Hamid could go back to his slide on the challenge and maybe uh, finish his talk here by recapping what the challenge will be. Um, um, to make sure that that is emphasized. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me and share my screen. While he's doing that, I would suggest that Ken can take uh, a, a image of that slide and put it post it on on the uh, this this session so that people know that that was also mm -hmm. something discussed in this session, so that people going to the site can see it. That would be a good way of letting people know about it. Yeah, yeah sure. Then I will just prepare it for you. But the Probably. challenge is that... Sorry? Uh, so do I need to describe this challenge or... It was Can you share the, the screen? It was in the beginning, yeah. Okay, then I would just... Yeah. Yeah, we, this is a, actually, this, we, we just got the notification today. So there is a lot of the preparation to launch a challenge and we hope we will get it uh, launched sooner. But we, we aim of this challenge to attract into novel approaches and works for ontology learning using the LLMs and we will consider these three tests in two phases. In the few shot testing phase, there will be information from train and tests that they will be shared. For example, types may be appeared in the test and train as well, and the relationships or hierarchical relationships as well. They will be shared between train and tested. But within the zero shot testing, there will be no train set we will just, in the test set, we will just provide the types, uh, terms, and we will expect the participant to identify those types and also construct hierarchies. In this way, we can just do the evaluation based on the, type, the grand truths that we have from the different ontologies. And for the ontology perspective, to beside the what ontology that we use in this work, we will consider the more ontology ontologies such as the DBpedia and gene ontology and other ontologies. And uh, there will be some kind of the formulation that we will share this for the task soon. I hope this works. If not, if you have any question. Uh, no questions, thanks. Thanks, that's very interesting. Well, we are uh, at our hour, and we've advertised what is going to be the next week, and I will also kick that one off at Fabian. So um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, please come again and help get the word out and uh, follow up uh, on, on this over time. We'll have a synthesis in about three weeks or so, so that um, as we move forward, we are trying to absorb some of what we're hearing, and that will help inform the next half of, uh, of the, the summit. Um, any final words from you, Ken or Ravi? Yes, I I'm just good. want to encourage everyone to come to okay. the next meeting yes. and yes. all the meetings. Yes. Um, okay. and, we, we have, and we will have Hamid's slides on the site soon, if not immediately, for people. Okay? Yes, I'll, I'll be posting the slides. Right. So thanks to uh, Gary and Hamid. Looking forward to exciting session. Bye, everybody. Thanks again, Hamid. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.